is we're into King James, and he's about to publish the King James Bible. We've discussed some things about King James' his life. There were attacks against him. Obviously, that's very flawed, and it's really uh, silly. There's a book, but unfortunately, I think it is out of publish because of the liberal agenda. But it's about, the book is titled, King James Unjustly Accused. I never mentioned that before in our previous discipleship class, but I would highly recommend that book. That's probably the best book that will defend King James' life. But even uh, in my previous discipleship class, I don't have to spend much time defending him because we don't believe the King James Bible because of a man. Right, yeah. So we have to actually look at the actual translation itself and the words. Yeah. So because of that, we can believe that the King James Bible, that it is the 100% perfect Word of God. Amen. If any of you here do not believe in that, then when you come to this church, you're going to find out real fast that we believe in that, and you're not going to be very comfortable in here if you don't believe in that. Right. Because we strongly believe in this, and this, does, this is based off of everything on what I teach and preach and what this church practices. Amen. So if any of you have questions about that, then you can talk to me and then yeah. we can discuss it. But if you won't even give me a chance and then just come because of some internet gig, then you won't last long, right. okay? Right. You come here to spiritually grow yourself, Amen. okay? To spiritually grow yourself. Uh, the Lord has given me that opportunity online to reach people out there and to get them involved in spiritual growth. Okay, anyway, so we're now at the King James Bible Translation Committee. Those Jesuits are not done. Those nasty rascals, what they're going to do is they're going to fight tooth and nail because they know once this book gets out, it's D-Day for them. And as a matter of fact, it, it, it did. The Jesuits were like pretty much uh, silenced and no more once the King James Bible came out. And the Great Awakening revivals and everything that changed our world was after the King James Bible was published. This was a significant historical timeline unlike any other next to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very significant timeline that literally changed the entire world. So the devil knows that, so he's going to use his agents of hell, the Jesuits, and the Vatican to do whatever they can to stop it. Now, everything that I'm going to teach to you tonight is based off of a book by David W. Daniels, and his book is called, Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible? Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible? I highly recommend it. It is in comic book style, so you cannot be bored. David Daniels is a man who graduated from Fuller. Now, that's one of the uh, top seminaries, to my knowledge. It's one of the top seminaries he got his master's from there. That speaks volumes against James White, who, didn't, who only got his master's from a distance program thing, from a distance learning thing. But David Daniels actually attended there and then got his master's. So he's a heavy researcher, and then he documents a lot. I mostly trust uh, what he teaches, actually, because he documents a lot, and he's very well re researched. Uh, there are some things that people might criticize against him, uh, but I don't bother with that. Uh, the ones that I'm going to, going to talk about tonight, I pretty much believe. Okay, but he documents in, you can look it up yourself. Now, the King James translation, once it started to come out, the Jesuits started to put their hands behind the scenes, and they're going to do whatever in their power to stop this. So then, first of all, was the King James Translation Committee themselves. Yeah. So they try to infiltrate as much as they can inside that committee. Now, that committee is locked very well. People criticize the translation process, but not even today's modern translators went through the rigorous process they went through. You got scholars from Westminster, Cambridge, and Oxford. So those are three top uh, universities. And you got scholars from those three centers combined together. And then I've given you some uh, descriptions and details of the King James Bible translators. They are intelligent men. There is no doubt about it. Very intellectual. There's no way that today's modern translators would ever go on par with them. It's, it's totally poor when you compare with the KJV translators. Uh, these men actually uh, had one committee send it off to another committee to another committee. And then not only that, you also had the public church involved. So everything was involved, so no one could basically insert their own bias in there. Right. So it's a very rigorous translation process. If people argue that, well, the KGB translators, they were Calvinist, or they, were uh, they believed in baby sprinkling, whatever, so then they inserted their translation in there. They have no proof of that except just uh, whatever bias that they can come up with. They, they dig up dirt on somebody else's life and assume there is a connection. No, that's an ad hominem argument. 
Okay, that's very, those are very poor arguments. If you want to disprove the translation, look at the translation, bud, okay? Look at the translation, bud. And there are manuscript evidence over and over again for every single error in the King James Bible that I came across, okay? So you have to look at the manuscript evidence. Obviously, you don't. You know why? Only the scholars have it. So then you... Poor people, you have to take the words of your pastors and your scholars because they got doctorates and they study Greek and Hebrew while you don't. So you have to believe them like, what, back to the Dark Ages, the Pope, the Vatican? Yeah, That's okay. what they want you to believe in. No, every man, woman, child, they have the right to take the word of God in their hands and then examine the scriptures for themselves. But you cannot do that if you tackle their authority, right? So then they pull up this gag to try to tackle the authority and make you revert back to the Dark Ages and trust in your popes. Anyways, so the King James translation process is very rigorous. It's hard to infiltrate. However, the, Jesu the Jesuits, they were able to successfully infiltrate two. That's how tight it was. So they were able to cram in two. And that's the reason why the Apocrypha was inserted in the original King James Bible. Because now you got Catholics involved in there, two Jesuits involved. However, if you look at the original King James 1611, even though the Apocrypha is in there, you can see that the KJV translators themselves did not believe the Apocrypha was part of inspired scripture. Now you might say, why do you know that? Because if you look at your current Bible, like if you look at the back page, you'll notice like the concordance section, it'll probably say concordance concordance, concordance on every single page, right? Or if you go to the map page section, it'll probably say map A1, map A2, map B, something like that on every page, right? So the Apocrypha was listed just like the reference notes right. at the right. end. So the Apocrypha was simply merely reference material. It wasn't part of inspired scripture. So then they put Apocrypha on nearly every single page of the original King, King James Bible. If you picked it up, and then you'll see that right over there of the original KJV 1611 that they had. So the Jesuits couldn't really successfully put some kind of Catholic dogma into it. So then failure one. So now here comes plan number two. Plan number two, they're going to do what some of you may have heard about the famous gunpowder plot uh, from Guy Fox. Hollywood put out a movie, uh, I think V for Vendetta or something like that, to try to praise and make the guy a good guy. But actually, he was an evil guy. He was part of the Jesuit conspiracy. Robert Catesby was the one mainly involved with Guy Fox. Robert Catesby's confessor was a Jesuit. And Jesuits, as, as I've told you, during that time period, right now they seem like very good people okay so let's just take that for granted even though I don't believe that okay but let's just take that for granted but during the Dark Ages it was common knowledge throughout history and I've given you too many quotes on that in previous discipleship classes that politicians governor leaders kings and queens saw these Jesuits as the most uh, demonic spies that infiltrated governments and spied on other countries and brought back reports to the Vatican this was long before CIA and FBI. Come on. Right. Long before CIA, FBI. And you wonder where CIA, FBI get their, uh, get yeah. their tactics from. Yeah. But anyway, that's another story. Yeah. It's another long story. As, as we continue on with the Jesuits, so they use Robert Catesby and Guy Fox to start the gunpowder plot. The plan is simple, okay? Dig a hole underneath Parliament, and then they can be able to kidnap King James' daughter, set gunpowder over there and blow up all the parliament. So that's what they started to do. They started digging underground. And as they started digging underground, then they came across hindrance number one. Hindrance number one, they bumped into a wall. So there was another building there. That was not part of their plan. So then they're like, okay, what were we gonna do? So then they bought the whole building or rented the whole building so that they can be able to pierce through the wall. All right. Hindrance number two, they were able to dig through, but then at the day that they want to set off the gunpowder, Parliament delayed the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, amen. All right, so then the gunpowder is it's going to, it's not going to stay uh, fresh where they can light it up and blow up Parliament, so they have to light it up quickly. So then, hindrance number three. Yeah. 
They were about to set off the gunpowder. All of a sudden, for some weird reason, King James wanted to send one guy randomly downstairs at 4 a.m. Yeah. The guy went downstairs. He sees one of the men with a torch, and he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> the guy was so baffled, and then the first thing he described himself, what's your name? And he said, my name's John Johnson. <laughs> well, obviously, that's a lie. So then... <laughs> I'm not lying to you. He literally called himself John Johnson. This is part of history. So then, they interrogated him. They obviously found out he was part of a plot. So then he confessed, and then they found the rest of the instigators. And then, now the next hindrance happened. So then they said, we're going to fight it out. You can see the Holy Spirit just kept interfering every time. All right. The next hindrance was when they took out their uh, rifles, and they're going to shoot it out. The gunpowder was wet. This was not their day. This was not their day. So then because the gunpowder was wet, they came up with a genius plan. We're going to dry out the gunpowder with fire. All right. So then they lighted a fire next to the gunpowder to dry it off. And then the gunpowder blew up, obviously. They injured themselves, bleeding and dying. One of those, one of those assassins crawled at the image of the Virgin Mary gave his last prayer, and died at the feet of that statue of the Virgin Mary. Wow. These guys were undoubtedly Catholic assassins. They were paid to do this. So we can see right here that the Jesuits failed, one, in their infiltration of the translation committee. Two, the gunpowder plot. That was probably their biggest one. They failed. So then, 1611 was coming. So then in 1608, 1609, the Catholics pulled out their Bible. All right, we're going to pull out our Bible so that we can compete with the King James. Some of you don't even know this Bible. That's how competitive this Bible is. <laughs> it's called the Dewey Rames, you know. How many of you have heard of that before, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I don't even know if I'm spelling Dewey Rames right. That's how much I don't know. So, so I'll give it... So I'll give it so much credit by spelling it wrong, if I spelled it wrong. So around 1608 to 1609, if my knowledge serves me right, about two years prior to 1611, the Catholics came out with their Dewey Rames Bible. Well, obviously, uh, it failed because not many of you have heard of that Bible before. Then 1611 came, and King James finally had the Word of God printed after the people have, the Vaudois have preserved the scripture relentlessly for centuries and martyrs were bleeding and dying for the word of God all the way to the early first centuries where Christians were hiding the scriptures and the word of God while being conquered. Did you notice Rome was the enemy ever since the beginning of the early century of the church all the way to 1611? Always tried to destroy the word of God. That should speak volumes to you. So the Catholic Church, that, uh, Roman, uh, that Roman pagan monster, always tried to destroy the Word of God. They failed every single time. T when they thought that they caught Tyndale, when he was translating the Word of God in English, it fired back on them. He instead prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes, and England had open access to the Word of God. So the Catholics were in trouble. Holy Roman Empire was in trouble. So the Pope said, I need to get that back into Catholic position. So they used Bloody Mary, who married Philip of Spain. That was big trouble. But then the Lord toppled her off and the Queen Elizabeth took over. And then the Jesuits used Mary, Queen of Scots. That didn't work out. And then at the, they sent the Sp uh, Spanish Armada. That would have been their uh, biggest victory because no one can conquer the Armada. Well, that failed. Then they tried to infiltrate the translation committee. Well, that failed. Then they did the gunpowder plot. That failed. Their last stand was their own Bible. That obviously failed. Then 1611 came and God said, Thus saith the Lord. Finally, after 1,611 years of the apostles, after they wrote down the originals, and then people tried to make copies off of it, and then memorizing scripture, and Rome constantly tried to demolish it, they finally had free, open access to word of God, which you and I have today. Amen. And it is the devil's job to make you doubt every word in that book now. Yeah. That should speak volumes. That should speak volumes. So we see right here that the King James Bible finally came out and then God was able to deliver his words 
to the people. The Jesuits were the biggest losers in history. Amen. And as a matter of fact, after 1611, uh, I'll explain more in our next discipleship studies, but the Jesuits became no more. Catholic kings and queens and Protestant rulers were kicking out Jesuits one by one, yeah. one by one, one by one. England was anti-Catholic, and then you got Spain, France, and then other parts of Europe kick, kicking out the Jesuits. And then what happened in the end after that is even the Vatican itself, the Pope himself, kicked out the Jesuits. That speaks volumes right there. So the Pope kicked out the Jesuits at the end. I mean, <laughs> that should speak volumes that these people are very demonic people. That, they're, that they scream out trouble, actually, the Jesuits. So the Jesuits, they start to do their counter-reformation. In their counter-reformation, they try, try to evangelize the world. So the Jesuits aren't done. They've always been a thorn on the side with Bible-believing Christianity, and they will carry on their fight. So they're going to continue on their fight. As they continue their fighting, they're going to go to missions. So they're going to go to other parts of the world and try to forcibly convert them into their religion. So Ignatius de Loyola, when he started the Society of Jesus, it was his goal to make sure that the world will be won at the feet of the Pope. I am going to be read from Jerusalem to Irian Jaya from Ruth Tucker. And I'll be reading on page uh, 59, page 59. Let's read about the Jesuit missions. What was their goal and then what they tried to do to reach the world populace. Page 59, the 16th century that was dominated by the events of the Protestant Reformation was also marked by a Catholic Reformation, a Reformation to counteract the gains of the Protestants. So that's the Counter-Reformation. Yeah. The Roman Catholic Church was anxious to cash in on this new wave of overseas travel and adventurous missionary monks and friars eagerly volunteered for duty. It was the late medieval religious orders, the Dominicans and Franciscans, that supplied many of these courageous volunteers. But it was the Jesuits, or otherwise known as the Society of Jesus, founded in 1535, that became the Counter-Reformation's most active participant. The founding of that organization, writes Stephen Neal, is perhaps the most important event in the missionary history of the Roman Catholic Inquisition. So the Jesuits, they uh, promoted their missions so that they can reach throughout all the world. It was the most important event in the missionary history of the Roman Catholic Church, as I mentioned to you before. The first one that we're going to come out, uh, come up with, uh, is uh, Francis Xavier. He's the first one we're going to look at. So you've obviously heard of that name before, but you probably don't know much about Francis Xavier. So Francis Xavier, no, he's not the founder of the X-Men, if that's what you're thinking, all right? Francis Xavier, he was part of that Jesuit order where he's going to try to be part of that world where they're going to forcibly convert the people to, to his religion. Xavier was born in 1506 into a Spanish noble family and grew up living in a castle in the Basque countryside. As a youth, he attended the University of Paris, where his interest inclined toward philosophy and theology. It was there that he began spending time with a group of Protestants, dedicated young Christians who were risking their lives for the gospel in the Catholic stronghold of Paris. But then Xavier met Loyola, a man fiercely devoted to the Roman Catholic Church, whose dynamic personal magnetism had a powerful effect on the spiritually unsettled young student. It was, not, it was not long before Xavier joined with Loyola, turning his back on the Protestants and on the tempting, lucrative career he might have had in the Catholic Church. Instead, he took a vow of poverty and celibacy and committed himself wholly to spreading the Catholic faith. So you can see right here that he originally was among the Protestants, but then the Catholic Church is what won his heart, so he joined the Catholics. All right, I hope that you're paying attention to what I'm reading rather than just simply seeing me mumble, okay? Well. Xavier's call to foreign missions came suddenly and with no supernatural attachment. Two other Jesuits had been chosen to go to India as missionaries, and when one became ill, Xavier was assigned to take his place. 
With less than 24 hours warning, he was on his way to India. So India was his first place where he started to be a missionary, Xavier. Now what happened was this, the Catholics got, gained a lot of successful fruit on their side. Xavier did not remain and go along. The westernized society, with its mixture of Jews and Muslims, was not to his liking. When his exhortations failed to make an impact on the city, he pleaded with the king of Portugal. Now listen up. When his exhortations failed, he pleaded with the king of Portugal to introduce the Inquisition and force the people to adhere to Catholic dogma and morality. You notice that mentality, that brainwashed uh, Holy Roman Empire mentality of the Inquisition? Wow. From Goa, Xavier moved further south in India to work among the impoverished pearl fishermen along the coast. Although Catholicism had been introduced to the area several years earlier, there were few signs of it when Xavier arrived. The people were Hindus and their response to Christianity depended largely on caste. The high caste Brahmins were antagonistic, only one being converted, but the low caste Paravas were much more open to change, realizing their status in society could not be worsened by such a move. Great crowds came out to learn and recite creeds, and baptisms were plentiful. So many that on some days Xavier was so tired from performing the sacrament that he could hardly move his arms. Yet baptism was to him the most important aspect of the ministry, and he would not deny anyone no matter how tired he was. So he was gaining a lot of people, even though in one region in India he didn't get it. In a different e region, south in India, he was able to gain uh, much results. Now, uh, there are some of my members here who are Catholic, actually. So then they understand uh, the background and they have uh, empathy toward their Catholic background. However, there's also a great disdain on my members Amen. who are former Catholics. Amen. The reason why is because they realize the lie that they've been under, that system that has damned people, and especially studying the history and the current, con I can't say that word, but the current, um, the current plots, okay, let's say, the current plans of the evil elites themselves that's all tied to uh, the Catholic, it's never, it's never ended. It's never ended. It's always been the enemy. Even today, as the churches have folded and joined the ecumenical movement of council churches, the Catholic has always been one of the people on top. Always. Always. They have always been the enemy of Christian church history. We have to remember that. Xavier's emphasis on baptism and his concentration on children went hand in hand. So he made a big deal about baptism. Xavier, so now I'm reading page 62. I've been reading uh, so far page to page. Xavier had not come to India to settle down in one area and establish a long-term ministry. He considered himself a trailblazer and was anxious to move on and lay the groundwork for Jesuit missions elsewhere. When he left India in 1545 for the Far East, his place was quickly filled by others. And within a few de decades, there were more than a dozen Christian villages, each led by a Jesuit priest. While back in Goa in 1548, he met Anjiro, a Japanese man who convinced him that with proper conduct and logical reasoning, a missionary could expect great results in Japan. The quote was, the king, the nobility, and all other people of discretion would become Christians, for the Japanese, he said, are entirely guided by the law of reason. Now remember, when I'm reading from this author about the word Christian, it's not really Christian. What they mean is Catholic, okay? Xavier arrived in Japan in 1549 and quickly realized that his ministry there would be much more difficult than the glowing predictions had indicated. So he was actually, the reports were wrong. So it was going to be tougher than what he expected. However, Xavier could write only months after he arrived that the people were very fond of hearing about the things of God, chiefly when they understand them. So once the P Japanese people had an understanding of what he said about spiritual matters, they were more open to his uh, teachings. The freedom to disseminate their beliefs that was granted to Xavier and his companions resulted from Japan's unstable political environment. There was no centralized government and Buddhism was on the decline. That situation continued after Xavier departed and the Jesuit missionaries who followed him witnessed impressive results. Uh, in the 1570s, a large, uh, large numbers of Japanese began turning to Catholicism. Some 50,000 in one region alone were baptized. 
And by the close of the 16th century, it is estimated that there were some 300,000 professing Christians. This all occurred despite a dramatic change on the Japanese political scene. Foreign missionaries were no longer made welcome, and Japanese Christians faced severe persecution, sometimes resulting in death by crucifixion. Wow. In 1638, several thousand Christians took part in the Shimabara Rebellion, protesting persecution and exorbitant taxes. They finally took refuge in a castle where, after weeks of holding their own, they were defeated and slaughtered. De but despite such setbacks, Catholicism continued to be a noticeable influence in Japan for more than two centuries. So he was able to gain a lot of results. What happened was the Japanese government, where they originally gave freedom, they decided to say, no, our culture is in danger now. So then they started to crucify them. The J Japanese Catholics, not Christians, they're Catholics. So then the Catholics, they tried to join the Shimabara rebellions. They failed. However, the Jesuits put a widespread influence there. Xavier returned to Goa following his departure from Japan, and from there he made plans to go to China. So, damn morsels, I guess. Thank God he intervened, for while Xavier was arranging entry, he contracted a fever and died on an island just off the coast of China. Thank God, before he sends more poison, right? Mm -hmm. Only ten years after his missionary career had begun. So then the Jesuits, they're uh, relentless and unlimited in their supply. So they sent another person to replace Xavier to China. Matthew, uh, I think it's Ricci or Ricci or whatever, but I'll mispronounce his name, okay? Now, do you remember who were the early Bible believers who went to China and even some parts of Korea and maybe Japan? Do you remember who they were? The yes, the Nestorians. Wow, this brother remembers his history. So those Nestorians, they were able to give the gospel there. And you already heard some accounts uh, that I've given to you about the Nestorians, their huge success. Yeah. However, they weren't able, uh, not everything is meant to last forever. And what happened sadly in the end was that the Nestorians became wiped off the map of history. China, I think it was during the Ming Dynasty, they started to um, put put their iron hands to work, and then wiped off any trace of Christianity and the Nestorian work. So then, unfortunately, the people who took over were the Jesuits. Wow. So Matthew Ricci was the one who was able to carry on the Catholic work while the Nestorians were unable to do so. So here's a brief intro about the Nestorians on page 63. Nestorians who traveled overland from Syria. It's always Syria. That's the birth of Bible-believing movement, right? During the 6th century were the first known Christian missionaries to China. Their influence began to decrease by the 13th century when the first Roman Catholic missionary, Friar John, arrived. He found considerable freedom to preach under the protection of the Mongols, who were then ruling China, and thousands were baptized. During the 14th century, however, when the Ming Dynasty came to power, missionaries were expelled, and again, all signs of Christianity were quickly erased. So then the Nestorians were wiped out. The Catholics who were able to send Friar John to carry on some work died out. The Jesuits continued. Now, some of you might be wondering, where were the Bible believers all this time? Oh, I'll tell you, it's that other poison that other poisonous doctrine that was responsible for their failure on missions that I've told you before. Yeah. So I'm going to show you later. Riki was born in 1552, the year of Xavier's death. His father was an Italian aristocrat who sent his son to Rome to study law. While there, however, young Riki fell under the influence of the Jesuits. And after three years, he turned away from his pursuit of a secular career and entered the Jesuit order. So distressed was his father when he heard the news that he left immediately for Rome to, to remove his son from the order. On the first night of his journey, he became ill with a violent fever and was unable to go on, accepting, uh, excuse me, accepting the sudden attack as a sign of God's anger with him. Oh, the elder Riki returned home, fearing what might happen if he were to offer further resistance. Riki's acceptance into the Society of Jesus did not signal an end to his secular studies. Of course not, because they prize higher ed, you know, the Jesuits, you might recall. Let's see right here. 
In fact, it was at the Roman College, a Jesuit school, that he studied under one of the most widely recognized mathematicians of the day, and it was this secular education that later paved the way for his very effective ministry with the literati of China. All right, page 64. Riki's arrival in China signaled the breakthrough that had long been awaited, though missionaries had for some time resided in Macau, entering China proper had not been permitted. But when word of Riki's expertise in such fields as mathematics, astronomy, and geography reached Wang Pan, the governor of Shui, uh, so I'm gonna always pronounce this wrong, all right? So you Chinese people forgive me, all right? <laughs> Xiu Hing, he invited Ruggieri and Riki to come and live in his province. So Riki had his chance now to go to China because of his educational background, his expertise. In the meantime, Riki has switched from a Buddhist monk's attire to that of a Confucian scholar, realizing such dress would win him greater respect. Confucianism was a religion of the Chinese intelligentsia, and more and more Riki was trying to win that segment of the population. If the Chinese could view Confucianism as merely a philosophy, then they could accept Christianity as well and not be forsaking their traditional beliefs. So that's how Riki was able to slip in. But you might recall that's how the next door university <laughs> yeah. was able to survive in, and adapt to this culture as well. They always adapt to everybody's beliefs. They're a chameleon, the Catholic Church. Anyway, while Riki was seeking to contextualize Christianity in China, another Jesuit missionary, Robert de Nobili, was doing the same thing in India, in essence, becoming a Brahmin to reach that case for Christ. He observed the laws and wore the clothes of the Brahmin caste, and he disassociated himself from the existing Christian church. Not, however, without a uh, barrage of criticism, both he and Riki were highly controversial figures within Roman Catholicism. Riki's effort to make Confucianism compatible with Christianity appealed to the Chinese and in no doubt increased the number of so-called converts, but in many ways it compromised basic tenets of Christianity. Well, of course, because that's how the Catholic Church always does. They're the, one of the most weakest religions when it comes to uh, their own doctrines. So then where an American Catholic would say, we don't worship Mary, you go to uh, South America, those Catholics worship Mary. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Anyways, page 65. Uh, Riki's great respect for the Chinese people and his eagerness to share his scientific knowledge with them brought him unusual opportunities that have been accorded few other foreigners before or since. In 1601, at the invitation of Wan Li, he was permitted to locate in Peking Peking and continue his mission work right under the nose of the emperor. While living on a stipend up from the imperial government, with him he brought a large striking clock that he presented to the emperor, and he and his fellow priests became the official clock winders of the imperial court. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Quote, when enemies tried to oust him, writes Broom Hall, the powerful palace eunuchs were afraid they could not keep it going and saw to it that Riki was not expelled. Now, do you see that? how powerful those Jesuits were? Yeah, yeah. They can build up connections. They're clever people. All right. Let's see uh, what he continues writing over here. In dogma and practice, uh, Catholicism unfortunately differed a little from medieval Catholicism in Europe. In his journal, Riki writes of Paul Hishu bowing before the statue of the Blessed Virgin before he entered the residence of one of the Jesuit priests and how after he was baptized, he attended the sacrifice of the Mass every day and found a great consolation in going to confession. So you can see right here that uh, the Catholic Church, they were very uh, fervent in their missions work. Okay, then what were the dimwit Protestants doing? What were they doing all this time? Why couldn't they spread the good news? While Roman Catholicism was spreading its hellish doctrine, damning people to hell, then what, what were they doing? Well, you can guess. Can any of you tell me what that poisonous doctrine is that perverted our line of Bible believers? Calvinism, Calvinism obviously. Why? Because God elects anyway. So because God elects, that's why there's no free choice involved where you don't do anything about it to give them the gospel because God already elected anyway. 
So because of that, it died down their motivation. Usually people who are missions minded people, they put a lot of their free will into it that, hey, we got to do more of this. We're not reaching enough people. We're not reaching enough souls. What can we do to reach more out there? A Calvinist mindset would be like, look, God's in control. You can let it go. So they might not be against soul winning, but they're not really soul winning minded. Yeah. That's the problem. That's right. They're more used to getting involved in politics and building up their kingdom and doing debates and writing books. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that today's? Yeah. 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 You know why we uh, Bible believers don't have the PhD papers going out? Because we got better things to do. We got to win souls to Jesus Christ Amen. and plant churches. Amen. Better than getting fluffy fluff degree. I only got the degree because I'm sick and tired of people using their degrees to... Uh, cram down on Bible believers, so then I bark back right at them. Yeah. And then they cry and whine that this guy is so arrogant, you know? Well, what have you been doing the past 10 years, huh? Right. Uh, anyways. Amen, All right, page 67. All right, this is uh, what the author wrote. Calvinists generally use the same line of reasoning, adding the doctrine of election that made missions appear extraneous if God had already chosen those he would save. Wow. So because of that, that's the reason why the missions uh, weren't really spreading. She also, uh, the author writes over here, the upsurge of Roman Catholic missions that occurred during the 16th century Catholic counter-reformation had no parallel among the Protestants. Worldwide missions was not a major concern of most of the reformers. Wow. That's sad. That's really sad. Yeah. Now, this is not to say that because of that Bible-believing line, they are going to have some kind of Bible-believing influence, right? So there are reformers out there who got some Bible-believing influence. You remember the Huguenots when they went through that St. Bartholomew's massacre? Mm -hmm. So... She, uh, the author writes, a number of French Huguenots to establish a colony and evangelize. Uh, so if this is politically incorrect, okay, the, uh, I'm reading from an older book, okay? So maybe that word was political. Uh, now they're updating terms nowadays to refer to different ethnicities. So I might as well just read from the book. So I'm reading word yeah. for word from the book, okay? Yeah. The Indians, okay? Evangelize the Indians in Brazil, okay? Unfortunately, the venture that began in 1555 ended shortly in tragic failure when the renegade leader, uh, Villegagnon, defected to the Portuguese, who then plundered the fledgling colony and left the few remaining defenseless survivors to be slain at the hands of the Jesuits. Okay, well, that's really sad, right? So then it started out with something with the French Huguenots, but then it wasn't meant to be. You can see that there was some uh, influence because of that Catholic influence and that Calvinist influence. Now, you might recall Calvinism has the same ideology with Catholicism that I told you before because they share the same church father they highly respect, Augustine, okay? Remember, Martin Luther, his intention was not to break free from the Catholic Church. It was just simply to reform it. So they have some Catholic influence there. So there is a Bible-believing line being built. However, because the Catholic Church dominated the whole world that time, that takes a lot of um, uh, deconditioning, so to speak, right? So they had to clean stuff up one by one. That's why the Anabaptists came out, right? Yeah. The Anabaptists came out because Martin Luther started it. And then the Anabaptists, they just studied more scripture, and they realized, hey, you guys are wrong about these doctrines. Then, give it centuries, we Bible believers came to the scenes, and we can point out, hey, Anabaptists and the other people were wrong on these doctrines. Why? Because it takes uh, years of studying the Bible, then we find out more and more and more and more and more. That's just natural. Amen. In any topic of study, go math, science, whatever, people have always learned more and then improved. Okay? What makes the Bible study so different? The 17th century saw more scattered Protestant missionary efforts, but aside from the work carried on, uh, in the American colonies, none of the ventures had real staying power. The Quakers had more than a passing interest in foreign missions, and in 1661, George Fox commissioned three of his brethren as missionaries to China. But the party never reached its destination. Some years later, Justinian von v uh, Welts, the first Lutheran foreign missionary, 
sailed to Suriname, located along the Atlantic coast of South America, where he gave his life in an unsuccessful effort to establish a mission there. So you can see that there were some fledglings uh, starting a work, but it didn't really bear much fruit. It was the 18th century that witnessed the first great thrust of Protestant missions. Now, this was the time, the 18th century. This is when mission work started to finally get in. So while the, while the King James Bible was being published, we got the martyrs who died out. The martyrs had descendants who were able to escape the persecutions, find Haven, and then later on, you know what happens? They can't just, uh, if you're a Bible believer, not a Calvinist, you can't sit in your little kingdom and be content. Come on. If you're a Bible believer, what happens is you get a burden for lost souls out there. Now, this is what really burdened my heart, which changed my life after studying this. These are people who got tortured, bled, and died. Now they finally have a moment of rest. But in their moment of rest, they still will not rest because they had a burden for souls out there. So they started to send out missionaries while we Bible believers sit on our blessed assurance and just enjoy fellowship with one another, getting money, and then uh, just trying to get a nice building and everything. Right. Come on. Yeah. Wow. So this really convicted me right here. We forgot the intention and goal of a church. There are three goals of a church. We do fellowship, building. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. And we're going to take our first, ch first church trip. That's exciting. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. However... It, that's just one of the goals of the church. It's called edify the brethren. Right. That's what we've been doing. But we forget the two other goals. We have to glorify God. Yeah. And the third one, evangelize lost sinners. Yeah. And trust me, this area is not enough. Our goal in every decision, what you're going to read here will put you under conviction. These are people who got tortured, persecuted, and also people who, got me who make sure their marriage decisions and their job decisions revolved around souls. Literally everything they did. And then it made me, uh, it reminded me about my job. It reminded me that my whole life's work was everything that I do, even in marriage or even in my future career, it had to be souls. Always had to be souls. Amen, Pastor. Not for fame, money, or getting a, a big building with big people. Praise the Lord. All right, so who are these first people? They were called the pietists, the pietists. Among the first to recognize this responsibility were Lutherans, Lutheran pietists. So uh, you'll notice the difference with them, with the, uh, with the other Lutherans that were more cold-hearted Calvinists. Lutheran pietists such as Philip Jacob Spenner and August Hermann Frank. So these are two important names. Philip Jacob Spenner and August Hermann Frank who had turned away from the cold formalism of the state churches. Boom, right there. They, remember, what was the problem with that Calvinism poison? It was that state church nonsense, remember? Yeah. From John Calvi boy? Mm -hmm. You remember that guy? Mm -hmm. so, be, so they knew that this was a cold formalism, that this was dead orthodoxy. So then, Frank, a professor at the University at Hall, turned that school into the center of continental pietism and of 18th century uh, evangelism and foreign missions. Foreign missions, however, was not an acceptable course of action for most 18th century church leaders and theologians, and pietists were scorned and ridiculed. Of course, if you're a Bible believer. Of course, if you don't go by the state church or the Catholic or Protestant or Calvinist. Of course, just like Bible believers today. Yeah. Street preaching, Scorned by saved Christians who are so concerned about our country and saving our country. Why? Because they have a church mindset that's mingled with the state. They were dubbed enthusiasts. Does that sound like you? Come on. <laughs> You're very enthusiastic. If I, one thing I learned about this church. They were dubbed priests of Baal. What? They were dubbed heretics. Well, I'm used to that. False Lutherans. Oh, so you're not a real Lutheran unless, yeah, yeah. what, you're Calvinist? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and dangerous people. Well, we're pretty much used to that term in our church. But their confidence in the rightness of their position propelled them forward. Yeah, that sounds like us, doesn't it? We have confidence in what we believe in. That's why we keep going forward. 
The first breakthrough in Protestant missions came when King Ferdinand IV of Denmark, a pietist himself, appealed to Hall for missionaries to evangelize the people in his overseas holdings, particularly in Trankabar, along the southeast coast of India. Bartholomew Ziegenbalg and Henry Pluschow uh, volunteered to go, and the Danish Hall mission was born. The following decade, in 1714, a missionary college was opened in Copenhagen that trained missionary recruits, including the great Hans Ingede, who established a missionary colony in Greenland in 1722. Hans and Getty is an important name that you want to know, but he was trained by those pietist background, okay? We'll come to him later. The most notable 18th century missionary to serve with the Danish Hall Mission was Christian Frederick Schwartz, a devout Lutheran who went to India in 1750 and served faithfully until his death 48 years later. Much of his missionary career was spent traveling along the coast of India, preaching the gospel and planting churches, an accomplishment that would have been impossible without his mastery of several languages and dialects. Though he remained unmarried and without children of his own, he conducted an effective ministry with children who matured in the faith and swelled the ranks of his church in Tanjore to a membership of some 2,000. During his lifetime, the Danish Hall Mission had seen significant growth, with approximately 60 of its missionary coming from Hall alone. But the enthusiastic spirit of earlier years was waning, just like every other Bible-believing church, unfortunately, if you give it uh, generations of time. At the time of his death, there were few new volunteers to fill the vacant post. Fortunately, the decline of the Danish Hall Mission did not sound the death knell of early Protestant missions. Another group, also influenced by the pieti pietism at Hal, had come to the fore and soon developed into one of the greatest missionary churches in all history. All right, these are the people that got me under conviction. The Moravians. You might recall in our uh, Bible Believers blowout, we had um, a oh. t-shirt with the Moravian seal of that ox. Yeah. Moravians literally dedicated themselves as servants, if not slaves, for the work of the Lord. These people were truly mission-minded people who put anybody in our century to shame. Any of these people. Common preacher, it didn't matter. They'll put A common uh, Moravian person would put a pastor to shame. During the 18th century alone, the Moravians planted mission stations in the Virgin Islands, 1732, Greenland, 1733, North America, 1734, Lapland and South America, 1735, South Africa, 1736, and Labrador, 1771. Their all-consuming objective was to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, a passion that was clearly evident in their proportion of missionaries to lay people. You know what that proportion was of missionary to lay people? The ratio was one out of 60 a noteworthy attainment in comparison to the ratio of 1 to 5,000 in Protestantism as a whole. Wow. So one of the unique features of Moravian missions, so I'm, uh, I'm going to now abbreviate the rest of this stuff. These Moravians, they didn't go like uh, place to place uh, begging uh, for money actually. They were self-serving people in the missions. So they supported themselves. And these people literally went throughout all the worlds. The person who made the huge difference that you want to know is Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. He's a very famous name among the Moravians. He was a very rich noble. And Zinzendorf, his parents uh, died when he was young. So then his other relatives took care of him. His other relatives had that good uh, Bible-believing influence, so to speak. So because he was surrounded by Lutheran pietism, at the age of 10, he was sent away to study at Hall. So remember, Hall was that center where they were sending all the missionaries. At that school at Hall, while Zinzendorf was studying there, he banded together with other dedicated youths, and out of their association came the order of the grain of mustard seed. That was the name of their Christian fraternity, actually. While visiting an art gallery, he viewed a painting that depicted, that depicted Christ enduring the crown of thorns with an inscription that read, 
all this I did for you, what are you doing for me? Wow. From that more moment on, Zinzendorf knew he could never be happy living the life of a nobleman. No matter what the cost, he would seek a life of service for the Savior who had suffered so much to save him. Amen. So what he did was Zinzendorf, this was a man who took in Protestant refugees who were being persecuted by the Catholic empires. And then he uh, gathered them in and then put, uh, put them in safe haven, actually. So then, because he had the money, he had the land. Now, at the beginning even, now some of my sources, uh, I would recommend this video. It's called First Fruits, and that's by Vision Video. You can watch it for free on YouTube, actually. But First Fruits is a great video that talked about the beginnings of the Moravian missions. So it'll be a mixture of this book as well as that movie. But uh, there were people who opposed him to set up a community, but then what happened uh, to take in these uh, Protestant uh, people who escaped persecution. However, it turned into a thriving community and then it became a powerful uh, group where they were able to have church support each other and be able to send out missionaries. However, uh, how they first started their missions, which is very interesting, was to the Caribbean islands. This was in 1738. Now what happened was is that uh, in the movie, there was a slave, I think his name is Anthony, if that's his real name. He escaped slavery, and then Zinzendorf mourned to his church members, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have had our own ancestors persecuted for preaching the gospel, but these people are persecuted without hearing the gospel. A black man entered a white man's church service, and they cut off his ear for hearing the preaching. And then Zinzendorf said, none of these people have heard the name of Jesus, and they're going to hell. So one of the people named Leonard Dober, he was so much under conviction and under so much grief, he could not get sleep that night. And then he surrendered to the call, I want to be a missionary to the Caribbean islands. Well, the problem was, if he wanted to be a missionary to the Caribbean islands, he had to become a slave. Now, this is uh, from the work. This is based off the work, Dreaming Beneath the Spires, John Leonard Dober and David Nitschman. So based off this work, I'm going to read it right here. When they were told that they would not be allowed to do such a thing to minister to the African slaves, so they weren't allowed to do that. So remember those uh, idiotic, that was mis mixed up with state church uh, white colonization, you might recall, that where England, Spain, France, and those other countries were involved. Remember that slave trade? It was all lucrative, and they were conquering the new world. So they, wouldn't, they do not want a white, one of their fellow white people to minister or give the gospel to one of the African slaves. A lot of it was mixed up with state church mentality. It was just awful. That's why I hate this state church nonsense, and Catholicism, ca Calvinism will be a thorn on my side always. But uh, because of that uh, nonsense and that wickedness that you cannot witness to them, you know what they did? Dober and Nitschman, so another person named Nitschman who j joined Leonard Dober, sold themselves to a slave owner wow. and boarded a ship bound for the West Indies. As the ship pulled away from the docks, it is said that they called out to their loved ones on the shore with their chains May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Amen. Put us to shame, man. Puts us to terrible shame. And that was their first recruits. In the movie, it's very touching. Uh, they rejected him. They didn't want, obviously, to hear another white man because all they saw was white people abusing them. So the African slaves, they uh, hated him, they despised him. But then he was able to le lead a, a, a child to the Lord, an African child. He was dying of uh, malaria, I believe. And then while he was dying of malaria, he said, Lord, I want to thank you so much for that you, that you sent me here to at least reach this one soul. He lived, and in the end, it stirred up something. A bunch of other Moravians started to answer the call. And they started to spread out after they went to parts in Africa, as well as the Caribbean islands where, where the slaves were located and all throughout the world. It was just, man, it's phenomenal. Zinzendorf, uh, literally the people said right here, 
The Moravian mission, above all else, the Moravian missionaries were single minded. Their ministry came before anything else. Wives and families were abandoned for the cause of Christ. Young men were encouraged to remain single. And when marriage was allowed, the spouse was often chosen by lot. So it's a little extreme what these people did. But you can see right here, the point is they had a very strong, a one minded, um, a set, uh, they had a one minded focus on souls. That was the thing of the ministry to reach people out there. There are two uh, famous people, uh, Christian David and Hans Engedi. So remember, Hans Engedi, he studied uh, at Hall, where the Lutheran pietists influenced him. Hans Engedi, he went to uh, Greenland, and then what happened was he was not bearing much fruit over there. The Moravians, they were worried about if Hans Engedi quitted. So then they sent Christian David to help him. Now, Christian David, originally, he was born in Moravia in 1690 into a Roman Catholic family. As a youngster, he was a devout Catholic, zealous in his observance of rituals, holidays, and his adoration of the Virgin Mary. Later, he recalled that his heart burned like a stove with religious devotion, but despite his deep sincerity, he had no real understanding of true Christianity until he was sent away from home to be apprenticed to a master who, along with his family, secretly embraced a warm evangelical faith. But even then, David's exposure to Christian teachings was limited. It was not until he was 20 that he acquired a Bible, a book that he had never before laid eyes on. In 1717, at the age of 27, David was converted, and soon after that, through the encouragement of his devoted wife, Anna, he became a traveling lay preacher. And what he did was go throughout that uh, Catholic Ro Holy Roman Empire mixed up with Protestant state churches preaching the gospel. And anyone who was persecuted, he brought them as a haven into Count Nicholas Zinzendorf's uh, estate. Wow. So he was just preaching everywhere. So Christian David was sent out to help out Hans and Getty in Greenland. Now, when they arrived, Hans and Getty was surprised. And then Christian David was also surprised. And there was that language barrier because they both don't come from the same country. And at the same time, you got to realize this. They're speaking to the Eskimos there in their language. These people had no edu language education or the resources like the Jesuits. They had to learn by themselves. So while frustratingly communicating with each other, Hans and Getty, Christian David as well as the Eskimos, that's how they did their ministry all that time. And we're too lazy to pick up a language book or something online where we can minister and witness to other lost souls. But these people literally were committed. So they found out through broken language communication that Hans and Getty, he wasn't intending on quitting. It was just a miscommunication. So then the Moravians joined, uh, and Christian David joined Hans and Getty, and they started to witness to the Eskimos. But during that whole time, the Eskimos had a disdain, and uh, they kept pushing them away, would not listen. However, what happened one time, though, was that uh, an epidemic spread throughout the Eskimos, and a lot of people were dying. What happened that time was Hans and Getty, he was very rough that time. He was more of trying to get them doctrinally right rather than focusing on getting them saved first. See, you got to get them saved first, give them time, and then one by one set down doctrine. That's how you should always plan a church. You can't get them all doctrinally right with you at the first day. That was Hans and Getty's problem. So then, uh, because of that, it caused the Eskimos to be more distant with him. But at that time, they finally saw his love in action. And then when the Eskimos saw that, they got touched by Hans and Getty's effort, and then they started to... Uh, be more drawn to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, what's very interesting from one of uh, the Eskimos quote is that uh, the Eskimos mention uh, to him, you have been more kind to us than we have been to one another. You have fed us when we were famished. You have buried our dead. Who would else have been prey to dogs, foxes, and ravens? And I'm particular, you have told us of God and how to become blessed, so that we may now die gladly in expectation of a better life hereafter. Wow. That's what the Eskimos said to him. Another thing was, even though during that whole time uh, the Eskimos were turned off by him, the quote was, he won their hearts by singing 
to them. In the end, uh, the Moravians were able to build off of Hans and Getty work and they gained more fruit. Uh, Hans and Getty died in 1758 at the age of 72. Uh, and then other people carried on the work. Okay, so that's where I'm going to end it off right here. There's a lot. Uh, I'll read a couple more on the Moravians' next discipleship. But it uh, really got me under conviction. Literally every decision they make in their lives, retirement plans, job, life, future, leisure time, they always think about souls in between. So when they get involved in a job, they're thinking about, okay, it's a nice, successful job. What am I going to use it for winning souls? Now, I want all of us to think about that. When you make a decision for a future school, job, promotion, or you save up money, what are you going to use it for to reach more souls out there? Okay? All right. Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Refresh our burden for souls. So many dying and burning in hell, Lord. And help us to remember, uh, remind us uh, our goal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.